So we have a Blue Beetle movie that is going to set a precedent. And we also have this movie, but the real thing to talk about is how if there's a March of the Penguins sequel, I have a new narrator, and that's Thanos. Movie talk starts right now. I could... <laughs> the Emperor Penguin. I, I, I would know. love to see I Thanos... Got that right? tweet out. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah. want to see Thanos narrate as much as Thanos wants to do, yeah. and that's not just because I'm trying to be on the 50% that survives the snap. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we are not dust as of right now. I'm merely Mark Ellis. Over there is special guest Kim Horcher. Hey, everybody. And you know what? This is just as special of a guest. Nobody's sick of this guy. John Come Steven on. Roca looking as cold as ever. Yeah, it's cold in this studio. I'm sorry. I know I, if it bothers you all that I'm wearing jackets, I'm not going anywhere. Two I'm trying to jackets. stay a while. But it is cold in this studio. Why do you I'm get sorry. so defensive right off the bat? We were because just asking. people judge me all the time for wearing jackets inside in studios. Like My, girl, my girlfriend gets upset. You two jackets my, inside. My, it's not, it's not just, just I, a, I'm it's sorry, a hoodie. I'm yeah, Kim, I, I noticed that you had warmer clothing yeah. when you entered and oh, you had a hood. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I have this uh, cool... Varsity jacket. Nice. Yeah, but you notice, Broca, Academy. she's not wearing it on the show. So we'll move on. Speaking of <laughs> Antarctica and penguins, that's going to be our first story, or at least it was going to be. And then we got some cool news up top. You can check out more on Collider.com. And that is a Tom Hanks, none other than the legendary comedic actor, dramatic actor. He's got Oscars on the shelf for both. He is in talks to play Geppetto in the Disney live action Pinocchio movie. Yeah, so Guillermo del Toro is making a Pinocchio movie. That's going to be on Netflix. That might be dark. Darker. This is the, the Disney version of the classic 1940s film. 40s film, I believe, where Geppetto, he's just a, a simple puppet maker. He carves this thing out of wood, and then the next thing you know, it turns into a real boy, and a horror film ensues, at least in my opinion. <laughs> Tom Hanks, this is early talks. We're not sure if, you know, hey, look, everybody who has been in a movie was in early talks to be in the movie at some point. <laughs> so Will Smith was in early talks to be the genie, and now he's going to be the genie in Aladdin. Will Tom Hanks be Geppetto? That remains to be seen. We can't speculate on that, but what do we love doing around here? Speculating on whether Tom Hanks might be right for the role of Geppetto. Kim, he's no stranger to the world of Disney slash Pixar. I mean, look, he voices Woody in the Toy Story movies, sure. but he also played none other than Walt Disney himself mm. in Saving Mr. Banks. So is this guy the right guy for Geppetto? Tom Hanks can play any white man over a certain age. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, if you think about the story of Geppetto, it is heartbreaking. Yeah, and he, yeah. can, he can make it happen. It's a man who can't have a child, who desperately wants one, and wishes that a piece of wood becomes an inanimate, no, an animate child. <laughs> and then he runs away, and he has to worry about him, and it's going to be a tearjerker. And, it, it, yeah, he's going to make it work. Look, my opinion, it's a blessing in disguise that you wish something into reality, and then the kid shows up, and he's like, hey, I'm a kid. Feed me. You're like, uh, go hang out with the Lost Boys. Wow. I'm no. not a fan of children. No. Uh, I'm not really that big of a fan of Pinocchio, to be honest with you. I just that it, it, It's a fine animated movie, Roca, and we know Disney's mm -hmm. going to do the live-action treatment with everything. Yeah. I'm just not sure we need this one, but if you tell me Tom Hanks, is yeah. that going to get people in the seats? Well, isn't there uh, 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 Guillermo del Toro version coming as well? We just On had Netflix, oh, yeah. No. Yeah, on Netflix. And we had that terrible Roberto Benigni version a few years ago. It was <laughs> horrible. Every <laughs> so, time uh, we do this show, but this you seem to bring up the Roberto yeah. Benigni Pinocchio. Yeah. I want it clear that it should never see the light of day. Like, it did, drop it from all streaming services, for God's sakes. But look, this is, I love the Pinocchio story because it's more, more darker than people think. I think the horror movie, you're not that far off. Turning into the donkey thing, he's screaming for yes. his mom. It's one of the most traumatic experiences if you're watching this movie at a younger age that you carry with you through life. I know I cared. I've never looked at a donkey the same way in my life. So this idea of a Pinocchio what? live really? action Do with you Geppetto, it's I like it. Trying to trick you no, all the time? They're just, they've got a weird smirk on their face. <laughs> Even when they're chewing that grass, I can tell they're Were you a big fan of donkeys me. prior to your viewing of Pinocchio? I was. I, I was a big fan of pin the tail on the donkey growing up as a young kid, and then I saw that, and I never pinned a tail on a donkey again. Well, now we fear. know why Eeyore is so depressed. Yes, Continue. there you go. Well, I love the idea that Tom Hanks would step in. Look, we've reached that stage. We've watched Tom Hanks from Bosom Buddies to Oscar winning Tom Hanks to middle aged Tom Hanks to now kind of veering into older characters, Tom Hanks. Kind of like Logan, he's like old man 
Hanks instead of old man Logan, and he's doing his thing here, and I like this idea. There's rumors about him. You know, he's playing Mr. Rogers. He's going to play this now as Geppetto. He will bring the right kind of tenderness and vulnerability to the character, so you'll feel what he feels when Pinocchio, because, damn it, I gave you life, and now you're running off with everybody else, and you don't want to appreciate the fact you have life, runs off and oh, leaves him alone. So gonna all be, of that's going to be there. It's going to be one of those father-son movies that makes yep. everyone cry. It may break me in half, Absolutely. probably, emotionally. Yeah. I'm interested to see how much they stick with, because Disney, for the most part, has been whatever their animated movie was, they stay pretty close to the source mystery, mm -hmm. with the exception of Maleficent, because that had to get into the backstory of Maleficent, yeah. and it, it doesn't change what we saw in Sleeping Beauty, but it certainly changes your portray or the way that you might think of Maleficent as a now sympathetic, to a point, character. As far as this Pinocchio movie goes, because I don't care about the movie, like, I'm not going to tell Tom Hanks what to do with his life. He's done a fine job up to this point. I would rather see him do something else, but I understand the need on his part mm -hmm. to play something like Geppetto because it keeps you as an actor out there in the public eye. If you're a person of a certain age, you're not going to be playing a superhero. Mm -hmm. You may not be opening movies anymore, but the fact that you're playing Geppetto, a name character in a huge name brand movie, Movie in the biggest corporation on Earth's film, that says something. So do you think that's probably why Tom Hanks is looking at this role, Kim? Uh, I don't think Tom Hanks needs publicity. <laughs> you think, think he's good? Oscar winner, America's sweetheart, Tom Hanks does not need publicity. But is he still America's sweetheart? He's, wow. he's going to have the Oscars on his shelf forever, yeah. but... I, he's not winning an Oscar for this, though. So he's the kind of guy that I think every time he shows up on screen, he could win an Oscar. Yeah. It, you know, you look at The Post, you look at uh, the, the, the Captain Phillips movie. Mm -hmm. You're not winning an Oscar for this, so why take it, Roku? You never know. He could win an Oscar for this. Depends on how it comes out. Paul King, who people love all these Paddington movies, it's still Paddington to 100% run tomatoes. That's unbeatable. How many Oscars do the Paddington movies No, have? it didn't, but that being said, this is a build, right? Paul King moving into now a bigger toy, a bigger uh, uh, sandbox to do the things that he's going to do. So maybe with this situation with Disney and with Tom Hanks on board, there are now unlimited, unlimited possibilities for him to possibly create something that could be nominated for an Oscar, at least his portrayal of Geppetto. Okay, I'm going to give you all two Pinocchio movies to see. You can either check out the darker, <laughs> more adult Guillermo del, Toro version, uh, Guillermo del Toro version on Netflix, or you can check out Tom Hanks playing Geppetto in the Disney live-action film, I mean, Which this way? is like a Jungle Book versus Mowgli situation. Exactly. <laughs> I would absolutely choose the Jungle Book over Mowgli. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Kim's going with yep. Mr. Hanks as Geppetto. I, I will go with Hanks because he just has a better track record at this point than Guillermo. Guillermo had a great Oscar, but then like those last two or three films before that, uh, before Shape of Water, weren't that good. Pacific Rim being one of them, and uh, what was the other one? The one with the horror. Crimson one. Peak. Crimson Peak. Yeah, not that good. So I like Hanks's consistency a little bit more than Guillermo's. That being said, I have to go. Uh, damn it! I have to go with my Latino brother, so I'll go with Del Toro. Fine. <laughs> I'm going Del Toro, <laughs> not because of ethnicity just because uh, I want to stay home and watch the movie on Netflix and not leave the theater <laughs> to go see the Disney movie. But it will keep you guys posted if Tom Hanks actually accepts the role or these talks continue to progress. Speaking of talking, the Russo brothers talked for about two hours last night <laughs> at the exclusive collider screening of Infinity War, the new Avengers movie, new-ish now. It was at the Cinerama Dome. A bunch of y'all showed up. Thank you so much for your patronage going to see this movie and then sticking around for our own Stephen Frosty wine trap of Collider.com interviewing the Russo brothers for what amounted to be almost as long as the movie itself. Many interesting tidbits came out of this conversation, one of which is Joe Russo revealing how the movie could have been very different in that originally they wrote a 250-page script that had Thanos being the narrator of the film. And it was really interesting to see his comments. You can check out everything that they talked about on Clutter.com is that Roka, with mm -hmm. Thanos as the narrator, yeah. they realized quickly that it wasn't the right structure yet, that they wanted to structure this movie more as like a heist film mm -hmm. with Thanos having to get something and the heroes trying to stop him in various circumstances. But having Thanos be the narrator of Infinity War, mm -hmm. I heard that and I can still hear Josh Brolin's interpretation of this character in my ears. Mm -hmm. You still, the snap, he's got so many iconic lines that I'm, I, I, I might vote for the guy for president in 2020, <laughs> depending on who he's what? running against. Yeah. Depending on who he's running against. <laughs> Thanos. Do you think that him as a narrator of oh. Avengers Infinity War would have worked? Yeah, uh, here's the deal. If, if that would have happened, you would have removed the great surprise of the movie at the end, which was 
that he survived and he won. Spoiler alert. And so if you have him narrating, instinctively you think to yourself, this is a person that survived these events because they're narrating the events in the past to you as a, a listener so or, or viewer. So to me, I'm glad they didn't go that route because the surprise at the end was worth it. And also the surprise, the other surprise, that this was Thanos' film, not the Avengers film. Thanos was the protagonist in this film, and that was a great realization when you're walking out of the theater and you have time to absorb the film, that damn it, the, ten, the, you know, the 20th film in the MCU, 10 years later, they make the villain the protagonist, and you actually kind of see his point of view for why he did these things and kind of give him a little bit of credit. And that's fascinating, and you would have removed that with him as the narrator. That being said, would have been very interesting to see that film. I'm sure they would have changed some things around, but still, I like the idea. I just think overall they made the right choice not doing it. Hey, Kim, this is one of those movies where we want to see every cut imaginable. We want to see this version and that version, and look, would I have voted for the guy? Possibly, but I stopped short of calling him the protagonist of that movie <laughs> unless you're looking at it from a certain point of view. Do you share Roka's <laughs> insight on any of this? So you're saying you would vote for him, and he mm -hmm. says he's the protagonist, and I yeah. get him. Are you taking crazy pills? I do! What is Maybe. No, I mean, he thinks or he says he's doing something mm -hmm. for the greater good, but he could have easily not killed everyone with that. And we, we've, we've talked about, well, we haven't. On message boards, we've talked about <laughs> how he could just double the resources. But instead, he decides to punish people and kill people. And he thinks he's rationalized in his head that this is a good idea. I mean, with a narrated version, this could help spell out his idea better. Mm. But ultimately, no. I don't want to hear him talk as the hero. He's mm -hmm. not the hero. Unless, unless you play it like comedically, which they wouldn't. No. Not with the tone of this movie. So were you no. mad at the end of the movie? I was not mad. I was kind of like upset. Upset. Interesting. You know, I was disappointed. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> I'm not angry. I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> um, I just... I don't agree with his rationale, Look, and I don't agree with his execution. Overpopulation is a serious thing in our world. But if you and had I thought he all had, the you power, could you could help the people of the world. You could go backwards, right, and make sure that we don't have overpopulation. That way you don't kill people, I'm sure. But he just thought this is the right you way to do it. Double resources. Yeah. And you doubling fix... resources still means you're dealing with traffic on the 405. Right. You know. You could double all the, the trees are gone. Mark, you could think double the big. 405. But all the trees are gone. Yeah, would you be okay with that? Because it would be more uh, tenements, more apartments, more housing, more all of that. But would you want that? What if we just use the power of astrophysics to create a larger universe? <laughs> well, we no. could do all that, and it would have been interesting to get Thanos' take mm -hmm. on some of this stuff, and we would have had a little more insight into what his thinking is. Although, I, I, look, to be honest, I'm glad he didn't narrate this movie because it would have felt like such a shocking departure right off the bat from all the other MCU movies that we've seen. And I don't need to know that much about him simply because I feel like what we did get from him gave me enough into who this character is, what his beliefs are. But Roka, I yeah. feel like I, I'm i agreeing with Kim here where at the end of the movie, I did feel upset and disappointed that mm. I lost all these heroes and that this guy, this bad guy won. What was your emotion at the end of the film? Well, I know that I cried when Spider-Man, what happened to Spider-Man, I know that I broke down. That was really emotional from the acting from Dom Holland and Robert Downey Jr. And at the end, I was... Uh, more, um, uh, well, the word I guess is respect. I felt nothing but respect and appreciation for, for what, no, no, for what oh. Joe okay. Russo and Anthony <laughs> Russo did. Like, for them to, to do this, and the MCU and Kevin Feige, for them to make this decision about this film, to go this route, I thought was incredible and very gutsy and something that nobody saw coming. So when it happened, people were just left with their jaws wide open afterwards. And that is amazing because shocking people 10 years into a franchise, in essence, this is all one big franchise or universe rather, is pretty incredible. And to do with what may be your seminal film is, is just, just a phenomenal work by them to do it. So my reaction was more as a film fan being like, wow, wow what an amazing decision to do this, to take this chance and do what they did. Um, so you guys hear this alternate version that we could have had. I'm sure there's a number of the theories possible. We could have gone this way. We could have mm. gone this way. After we screened it again for fans last night, Infinity War went the right way in y'all's mind, or we could have improved upon that, given the fact that we're getting the companion piece right. in the midway point of next year. I mean, I think in the meta, we know these deaths are not permanent. 
Well, we don't know which ones aren't permanent. Either. Okay, we yeah. can say for sure not all of them are permanent. Right, not all of them. Are Pretty sure your sure. boy Spidey's going to come yeah, back. He's got Black a uh, film coming yeah. out. Yeah, Black Panther. And yeah. we're not throwing away the Guardians. Well, we don't know what's happening. Oh with the wait, Guardians, right? That's another meta. <laughs> <laughs> Two layers. <laughs> it's too much to think about. Infinity War. We don't know what the name of the sequel is yet. We didn't get that tidbit. We did not get an Infinity War trailer. So we'll hope for next Thursday, and we'll see how that goes. But we do know the movie comes out in early May of 2000. And 19, will Thanos be narrating that one? Just have to wait and see. Another thing we're going to have to wait and see is what is going on with this new Kingsman movie. We had talk of a whole Kingsman universe. Matthew Vaughn gets his way. Not only does he want to do eventually a direct sequel to Kingsman and the Golden Circle, that's going to be done after they do this Kingsman prequel that is said to be more of a period drama than it is going to be some crazy high fluid action adventure piece. And we have some casting tidbits. Uh, Collider exclusively learned that Reese Siphons, if you don't know who Reese Siphons is, he was on Collider. Not, well, he's probably on Collider at some point. He's also on Game of Thrones. And he's the hero kicker from the Washington Sentinels in The Replacements. He's a great <laughs> character actor. He's going to be joining the cast in an unknown role that is speculated to be somewhat villainous and here's some other casting news we have daniel brule and charles dance are going to be in the film um ralph fines is going to co-star in the movie possibly as the colin firth ish character to harris dickinson's conrad who's a cocky young world war one um fighter i believe so kim yeah we talked about this yesterday where we have a number of different game of thrones stars that could be into this Kingsman of universe. Course. Get Charles Dance. Get Reese Siphons. Do you want to see the prequel? Do you want to see the sequel? I'd rather, I'd rather we move forward in time because I think prequels are often hampered with we already know how this is going to end in terms of which characters we've already seen uh, and know to be alive. I'm not sure we need a prequel for this but it could be that I have prequel fatigue because <laughs> I don't think I like any prequels I've seen you've, you've never seen a prequel that you like mm, I like Rogue One okay Rogue That's One's good yeah. I didn't like the Star Wars prequels fair enough I really didn't like uh, Fantastic Beasts either of them no mm -hmm. Not a fan. Agreed. You're starting to sour me on prequels now. But I hear this, Roka, and I think, okay, well, it's going to be a period. I, I want to see the origin of, of the Kingsman because unlike some, times you see a prequel and you learn a little too much about something, I would like to see the yeah. first tailor shop that they had. I would like to see the origin of that, of the yeah. man who would be Kingsman, as it was described by Matthew Vaughn, right. as we reported yesterday. So where's your head at now that we have these casting announcements? I mean, it's a pretty A-list cast we got going so far. Yeah, I like it. I like Charles Dance. I've always been a fan of his since last act. Hero, I've been a fan of Charles Dance. So, to see, to <laughs> yeah, see yeah, him, the weird eye, yeah, and the weird eye to see him doing multiple. I love whenever he pops up. Alien Three, I love when he pops up in films. It's always a joy, and he's a very good, solid actor, and obviously fantastic as the patriarch uh, uh, there of the Lannisters on Game of Thrones. Reese Ifans is an interesting cat. You know, he had that weird kind of run in at the at Hall H and Comic Con for that sp Amazing Spider-Man film. What? Yeah, a little bit of a drunken run in with a security guard. You can find that video oh. on YouTube. But That's I like, awesome. but I like him in Notting Hill. I like him in a number. <laughs> of other uh, UK films that he's been in so that's a good actor and Daniel Brühl who I've been a fan of since what Rush and then uh, uh, he did uh, Zemo Zemo right so have, so you're setting this in a period a period piece of World War One. we saw that in Wonder Woman and that was a great uh, interpretation of World War One uh, through the background there for Wonder Woman so I'm excited for this prequel in this way I'm a fan of historical films so if they're going to go back during that time seeing that time again seeing what can happen maybe Daniel Brühl is playing a German, you know, nationalist mm -hmm. who gets involved in that kind of thing, and he's like an evil guy. So then they're going to have to stop him, which would make sense. He's played a Nazi already in Glorious Bastard, so it would make sense going down this route there. So I, I like the idea of all these people coming together, and it seems to me like less of a star film and more of a film film. You know what I'm saying? And so I like that. Yeah, and I think that's what Vaughn mentioned as much as he's going for. He doesn't want any sort of star power to mm -hmm. overwhelm the fact that he's telling a story, but. The fact that this is being described, Kim, as a period drama more so than this uh, hyper-violent uh, comic book telling of the spy service, period drama, does that interest you or should we stick with what's worked? They do interest me, but when you hear the word Kingsman, you have an idea of what to expect. And it just, it seems a little odd to take this route unless, you know, they could have an incredible intriguing spy drama instead of just the craziest action scene you've ever seen and Which you I'd might appreciate that more mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think it going off your point it might work better as just a film film yeah as opposed to let's 
kind of try and connect all the dots so it fits in the franchise puzzle Mm -hmm. where it's supposed to be. I think we've seen a lot of uh, movie trilogies, franchises make mistakes in that way of trying too hard to make it connect as a whole as opposed to one solid movie. Yeah, will we get like the Skywalkers? Will we get uh, Colin Firth's family going back generations to be Kingsmen or Eggsy's family going back generations to be Kingsmen? Oh, you think Ralph Fiennes could be like Colin Firth's grandpa? Yeah, that's what I feel like that's probably what the situation is there, yeah. Okay, well the big question is uh, what do you consider a prequel? Uh, Is Godfather 2 a prequel or does it just have flashbacks? I don't consider that a prequel. I consider Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, that's a prequel. Right. It's good. I would say I would say yeah that's a that's not a prequel Godfather 2 absolutely because it exists going forward and going backwards. So that's a very unusual film that n- hardly any film has ever gotten right doing both at the same X-Men time. X-Men First Class? Uh pre- prequel? Yes. yes. Kind of? Yeah. I'm just trying to give Kim some hope. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that some, some prequel. prequels could be good. Monsters U, I didn't like that much. It what? Was okay. I thought oh, it I was like pretty Monsters good. U. It wasn't nearly as good as Monsters Inc. No, no. no. Yeah. Temple of Doom wasn't that's a terrible movie. So I don't terrible know. Terrible movie. So don't That's use that. It's not terrible. To wow. It's no Raiders, but it's not terrible. Come on. Terrible movie. All right. We're going to hold you to that. That Ripping is hearts live. out of chests. Come yeah. on now. Okay. Well. Check out the latest episode of the Riley Roundtable. That's what's around these parts as well as an all-new Schmodown airing tomorrow right here on Collider Video. And our next story is a groundbreaking one at that. We're going to get a Blue Beetle movie. And better yet, this is DC and Warner Brothers greenlighting the film that will have the first Latin superhero-led movie. That's going to be that version of Blue Beetle. It is going to be written by Mexican-born screenwriter Gareth Dunnett Alcoser. And they're going to be writing the screenplay. And this is going to be about, look, there's been a number of different iterations of Blue Beetle through the years. This is going to center around the character Jamie Reyes, and uh, it's it's a teenager who basically gets the scarab that gives you these these powers, and Roka, just hearing yep. this news is very, it, it's exciting to hear that we're going in this direction, that Warner yeah. Brothers in D.C., because we've been talking about a Blue Beetle movie as far back as the origins of the DCU that we now know mm-hmm. it as, as possibly factoring into that world, yeah. or then maybe going off on a different direction. We know that the DCU, we're not sure where the hell that thing's going. Right. Are you excited for this news, and do you see this as possibly factoring into any one of the known universes that are currently under the Warner Brothers banner? I could see this connecting to Shazam and Wonder Woman really easily. I don't know how it could, and possibly Aquaman, but and it depends on what Matthew Vaughn does with that Batman movie, and we'll see how it connects. But me speaking as a Latino pundit and critic, this makes me so effing happy because it's time it's 2018 it'll be to the 1920 whenever it comes out but it's time it's time you know this is great and on the heels of of how fantastic into the spider-verse is with miles morales who's half uh, black half puerto rican that combo seeing the the public's tastes it's changing and we're more accepting regardless of what you see out in the or read out it's true we're more accepting we're seeing this and the reason it's happening is because people in charge at studios sense that finally the public is ready for this so so I'm excited for this. Jimmy Reyes is a fantastic character in the DC comics. There are people pushing back, going, oh, we don't need Ted Cord. We don't need Ted Cord. Ted Cord being part of it would be awesome. I grew up on Ted Cord, so when it switched over to a Latino guy, I didn't all of a sudden forget toward Ted Cord or think we don't need him. No, there's a history and a legacy. So maybe Ted Cord is a part of this, connected, maybe helps Jamie, shows him the ropes, that kind of thing. Uh, I would love to see that. So for me, Jaime Reyes coming along, doing this thing, being the focus of a Blue Beetle movie is so incredible. And it's a seminal day, and it's a fantastic day for this to finally happen to hear this news. And I hope it comes to fruition. I hope they cast it correctly, and it has the same vibe that Into the Spider-Verse had in respecting the culture and also being universal in its appeal. This report comes uh, courtesy of The Wrap. And so Kim Roke is postulating that maybe there is room for multiple Beatles in this universe, and it could be a lot like what we see with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where Miles Morales is right. the central figure, but there's also a Peter Parker yeah. that you may take some notes from as you matriculate into your own superhero skin. How do you see this movie shaping up? I'm really excited for Scarlett Johansson to star as Jamie Reyes. <laughs> you guys, it's going to be so good. But I like this Poor attitude, which is finally executives deciding, oh, I guess people are ready to identify with someone who isn't the same demo that is, has been at the star of every right. movie for a long time. I mean, some people might be angry and look at this as, oh, it's, it's tokenism, but it's not. When you have different points of view, they have something to offer. Yeah. 
And Jamie, by the way, is a hilarious character. This is, I want, I want this to happen, and then I want Young Justice to come around. Yes. As a live action thing, it could be a series, you know, whatever you want to do with it. It's like making me excited right now, the prospect of it. Well, and it's smart uh, studio business wise, isn't it? You start with the younger characters, they still have the legacy of the older characters, but they're younger in interpretation. And Young Justice is, is exactly that. So, this is smart business wise. You get them for three films, you make that money if you do it right. Instead of casting old, like old Batman and Ben Affleck, like old Superman or older Superman with Henry, they want to go young. This is smart. And and you can still have Wonder Woman, in essence, be the leader of this team uh, as well, because she's kind of showing them the ropes as a young hero. So I love it. Just in terms of, of, of the progress that this news represents and some recent casting announcements that we've had that say, hey, you know what? We're starting to go outside of what the norm mm -hmm. has been for comic book movies and for film in general. I think a lot of studios are going to be paying close attention to the box office receipts that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse mm -hmm. receives, because that movie, it surprised me at how well it's tracking with 20 to $30 million opening weekend, that number keeps going up. You're going to see a lot of people start to greenlight a lot of exciting projects. And that's even already true within the world of Spider-Man. Because we already have uh, the female-centric uh, characters that are going to get their own spinoff movie, a direct sequel. And that's two weeks before the films even come out. Have both of y'all had the pleasure of seeing I have. Into the Spider-Verse? I have not. But all of my friends are saying it might be the best Spider-Man movie, and I'm very excited. I would uh, count myself amongst those ranks. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a screening we're doing uh, through Collider at, seven, at 7 p.m. Just, just set the guy right on what? Monday night at the Arclight. So, Kim, can you, I might, come? you could apply for tickets. Oh, I have to apply? There's an there's a address you can go to. Well, maybe I know somebody who can get you in. But, like, there's an address if you fans want to come and see Into the Spider-Verse. The directors will be there. Perry's going to do the Q&A. So, that'll be a fun night. I've seen it already, and I'm going to go, like, seven to ten times to see this movie. It is so good. You cannot savor it all in just one viewing. There's so much to enjoy in the film. So, I love this idea. And you throw in the fact that Miss Marvel is being talked about, the uh, mm -hmm. her version of it, and then Silk. The Korean American. So there's a lot going on here that will now spread. This superhero fatigue is never going to happen. This, there are so many avenues to explore with these great characters. So yeah, and uh, we even worked in the collider plug we had to do. Hey, yeah. oh, look at that. That, that. that played out like a life insurance commercial. You know, when my Maury died, I didn't have any money. Oh, you should have signed up to collider.com and you too. You go see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. That's right. Check out collider.com for all the details. You'll send an email. You write something very specific in the subject header, and maybe you could. Could be there. Is that the Arclight Roka? How at, much about this do you know? At the Arclight, 7 p.m. That's what I've been told. That's where it's going to be. I don't know if it's in the dome or not, but I know that's where it's supposed to be. Awesome. And as I said, Perry Nemiroff will be doing the Q&A with, I think, Lord Miller are going to be there as well. So, hey, you know, what a shock. Lord Miller can direct all kinds of great films, but apparently couldn't direct a Star Wars okay, film. Okay, we're going to move I'm on to I'm just going to say. Story, cool, and that would cool. be Dear Evan Hansen, <laughs> get me out of the latest Roka solo rant. <laughs> Thank you in advance, Mr. Hansen. Well, if you've heard those three words, Dear Evan Hanson, it's probably because you know something about Broadway. The musical uh, was a hit, won a bunch of Tonys, including for the star Ben Platt. Now it's going to be a movie, and Ben Platt may reprise his role as the titular character. I believe he plays Evan Hansen. I'm, I haven't seen the play. I'm, I enjoy plays when I get there, but the problem with me when I go see live theater or musicals is that I get very nervous for the performers. I can't stand if anything goes wrong. I feel so, eh, I just don't like it. I'd rather be on stage telling the joke or or else I don't want to be in the room at all. With this, Dear Evan Hansen, I don't have to worry about that because it's a movie that's already going to have been filmed. Either one of y'all familiar with Dear Evan Hansen? The, I have not seen it. The Broadway production? I have a few friends who've gone o over the last couple of months that's been here in L.A., and every one of them talk about how much they really enjoyed it and like it brought them to tears uh, and it's a very moving powerful play or musical uh, with a great central character and a story that the, the central character is going on is very universal in that way and so I'm looking forward to seeing this a live action uh, version of this is great God forbid, and I think this is a greatest showman thing, God forbid we start w walking into another golden age of musicals. Why? It would be really great if that happened. I would love that okay. to happen. No, no, I'm saying for people who are You're like, You're saying oh, God hate. forbid facetious. Yeah, exactly. Because okay. people are like, oh, I hate musicals. But like, because Kim was ready to. Yeah, Kim was ready Why to. Why would you say that? No, I know. Because <laughs> with the West Side Story that Steven Spielberg is doing, Mary Poppins. With, with Rita Moreno now coming on as an advisor and playing a part, and then you have Mary Poppins, right? So this is starting to happen. I think greatest showman. Kind 
kind of start, not didn't start this thing because all these things have years to develop, but certainly kind of showed the, that there was a taste for it because nobody expected that film to do as well as it did. And it did $400 million plus worldwide. That's incredible. And so these other these other musicals coming down getting feature film ad adaptations. As a fan of those old school MGM musicals and musicals in general, this excites me because I love the medium of film for a musical. Uh, Kim, can I go ahead and put you in the same cruise ship as Roca, where a lot of singing and dancing is going to be happening in movie theaters? <laughs> I am a weirdo, and the only kinds of music I like tend to be soundtracks oh, of movies nice. and musicals and video games. That's very interesting. Okay. I, I, I don't know why, but I, yeah, I, when I watch musicals, I get obsessed with them. So mm -hmm. I am excited for this and the possibility of what it could bring, which is more musicals. Okay, so what musical soundtracks have you been obsessed with? Give us a sampling of uh, what we could find Wicked, on Kim Horcher's for sure. radio playlist. Wicked, yeah. uh, you're going to be mad. Frozen. Okay. Um, I have a lot of video game soundtracks. I have the original Mass Effect trilogy, Borderlands 2, a lot of Disney, just a lot of Disney. Okay. All right. Goofy okay. movie. I know a little bit about a, a Goofy movie soundtrack. About uh, <laughs> after today. Powerline song? I, I know some Powerline songs. If you listen to that Powerline song, the one at the end, Eye to Eye, sounds a lot like Jump. I'm just going to say. Powerline, <laughs> maybe borrowing some, some inspiration from the mighty Van Halen there. Uh, what's a deep cut on the Frozen soundtrack? Because everybody knows Let It Go, and we've heard that. That's the big yeah. hit. I what's mean, a deep cut on there? Do you want to build a snowman? They, they kind of wasted Jonathan Groff on a character who oh. barely sings. Right. I think it just goes, reindeers are better than people. Sven, <laughs> don't you think I'm right? <laughs> That was, that, that was a great people, uh, we'll <laughs> I'll take Olaf. That's anyway. right, buddy. We'll call it a night. And it's oh. like, he's a great singer. Why did you? It was like when they cast Adina Menzel in Enchanted. And was it Enchanted? The one with... Um, Amy Adams? Amy Adams. That's in Enchanted, yeah. And she didn't sing. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Yeah, pretty, pretty incredible, you know. Pipes on Adina Menzel. Mm -hmm. she, she can really belt it out there. We saw her live at, uh, at a D23 Oof. when they were announcing Frozen. Yeah. So I, I didn't know who Adina Menzel was. She comes on stage and just, whew, yeah. again, incredible stuff. So musicals, you guys are on board. I am. Dear yes. Evan Hansen, yeah. let me add one little tidbit to this because it follows a teenager has social anxiety. There's a tragedy that happens. They yep. feel guilt for it, feel a lot of things. The director right now, I think this is according to Deadline, is being eyed as uh, Stephen Chbosky, mm -hmm. who also did Perks of Being a Wallflower. Ooh. So talk about a coming-of-age story, and that's clearly what Dear Evan Hansen leans toward in a dramatic sense. I kind of like that choice as well. So things shaping up right for this movie. You get the same kid, Ben Platt? Yeah, you got to. His dad's producing it. Why yeah. not? Mark Platt. So why not? If you can't get your kid, son, how strong of a producer are you? Like, you got to be able to get your kid on the show. For yeah, more nepotism, please. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying you only originated this, the thing. It's not like you're giving him the role. <laughs> Did you know that uh, Jeff Conway played Danny Zuko on Broadway of yes. Grease? Yes. And then, they, and then they, they were making the movie Grease. And obviously Travolta is Vinny Barbarino. They're like, hey, Conway, we loved you as Danny Zuko. You get to be Kanicki. Yeah. So, who would you be in Greece? Who would I be? I would be. Who's the other guy? Who's the guy that when the uh, the scorpions show up, he pulls out a water pistol? <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. I'm the guy shooting a water pistol <laughs> at the switchblade wielding scorpions. All right, we move on to our last story, and that would be the Welcome to Marwan trailer. We've seen a number of trailers to this movie. I already starting to see some ads on TV. It comes out December 21st in a packed weekend at the box office. The Steve Carell film is based on a documentary that was made by Jeff Malmberg. The documentary is called Marwan Call, and it's basically about this guy who is nearly beaten to death. He loses his memories, and in order to get some sort of therapy because he can't afford to go to a therapist, he builds this little village that's World War II era in his backyard, and he lives out his, his fantasies through there. So he has people that are in his life that play roles in this and the trailer that's the movie's directed by Robert Zemeckis and it shows him being able to pair that against his real life and eventually he's going to have to face some sort of reality. How will he be able to overcome that? Will he be able to use his imaginary buddies in his real life ventures going forward? What do we feel about this trailer? Kim, I'll start with you. Are, are we I've, charmed? Are we confused? I've seen Marwin Call, which makes me think my vision of this might be tainted because I already know what the basic oh. conceit of it. Okay, so you see Marwick, did you like the documentary? Is it a good yeah. documentary? Oh, yeah, it's cry time. Oh. <laughs> so are you worried that maybe this telling, this dramatic retelling of it will not be able to live I up to... I think it looks very charming. Okay. I mean, especially with the, you know, plastic doll mm -hmm. aesthetic mm -hmm. of it. I, 
I think Steve Carell has proven that he can play dramatic roles that aren't Michael Scott, even though that's all I want. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it's gonna. It looks good compared to what I know about the story, the real story. Okay, well, he's also in Beautiful Boy um, that is an Oscar-contending film. He's probably going to be up for some sort of Best Supporting Actor for that. Mm -hmm. With Welcome to Marwin, uh, my big concern with this movie, Roke, is that Zemeckis directing it. I'll see anything Robert Zemeckis does. I love him as a director. I just, I'm concerned that this is the movie that gets lost in the wash of Uh your Bumblebees and your Aquaman and your Mary Poppinses. So where does this one fit in? Yeah, if this makes $10 open a weekend, I'll be surprised. Like, I just think it's one of those smaller films that people aren't going to run out to see plus i'll be honest with you it looks a little creepy like i get what they're going for and i respect the fact that it's a guy who suffered an attack and these people bullied him and he doesn't have like you said he can't afford therapy so he finds this place to kind of explore his thoughts about what happened to him and part of the uh, therapy that he has to go through to come back to being himself or some version of himself again somewhat normal but there's a darkness to this trailer as well that really is kind of unsettling though you see the guys coming in in the jump he's like really nervous about how to deal with them. So I think there's going to be a lot of moments that are very uncomfortable and unsettling through the film. However, it's a little, the thing that is really unsettling to me is a little too much of the plague action the doll thing. That just kind of creeps me are out. Are you getting bit. Uncanny Valley? Is that what that, yeah, that's what when it feels it like to me. human-like, but not human-like yeah. enough. And it's uh, unsettling for me. Oh, you uh, mean like Simba's eyes in the new Lion King trailer? <laughs> Sorry, am I the only one thinking that? Yes. All the other animals look, to- I'm totally blind. And then yeah. I see Simba, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's uh, something you went into fair. Yeah, but I don't mind it with the apes like in the apes it's great the planet of the apes i buy it in the that's up yeah. so believable but with this just a, it's just a little but too they're, weird. they're supposed to be weird yeah but they're also killing people in these in these uh tr- clips from the trailer like they're actually no, killing it's like gi joe yeah. uh-huh. they're fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's it's fine. Fine. these are toys okay <laughs> yeah i, I don't know, want you to have nightmares these you, are toys once you give them human characteristics give them human faces and start moving around like humans they stop being toys it starts being real <laughs> Yeah, I think the animation looks pretty, pretty stunning on this one. But welcome okay. to Marwin. We're not sure if John Roke is checking into no. the Marwin Hotel or not. Kim Ohorcha has seen the uh, the documentary. So should I check out Marwin Call? Do you think that's a good it's a good rec- Would you recommend it or do you have to be in a certain state of mind it's, to check it out? I think it's very touching. I think it's very likely this is uh, a movie that will evoke some tears. Okay. I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be catch like fire it's probably going to get lost yeah it's just maybe this is the movie that should have honestly moved up because we've been talking about this uh the last couple weeks is that december 7th seems pretty wide open for movies to be released Uh, december 14th they're gonna have the surprise hit of spider-verse we think along with mortal engines but why wouldn't welcome to marwin be the one that just moves up to december 7th we'll never know the movie does open wide release on december 21st alongside bumblebee and aquaman amongst other films that are going to be coming out a little bit later on christmas day well we're going to save some time for your live twitter questions so go ahead and start tweeting us at collider video use the hashtag collider movie talk want to remind you all that tomorrow on collider it's friday and that means it's time for movie review talk hosted by the very shy scott mance and then you're also going to get like i said a schmo down and you get a new tv talk and check out the weekend show mailbag parent emeroff and a special guest go through a lot of your questions that you email or you can tweet us and we have some tweets right now and I like a lot of them. So the first one I'm going to kick off with is just continuing this trend, Roka, Kim, yes. of hoping that there's a Avengers Infinity War 2 trailer right around the corner. Uh-huh. So for no other reason, we have something else to call this movie other than Avengers Infinity War Part 2. Marco Gonzalez writes us and says, the Russos will be at the Video Game Awards next week. So the Avengers 4 trailer has to be coming, right? <laughs> no. Kim says no. Yeah, I don't. I, they'll drop it when they're ready to drop it. And I, this whole anticipation and waiting around for it, like you're just. Use that energy for something else because you're just getting disappointed every week and every day. And people are like legitimately very disappointed the thing didn't drop today. So uh, I, I just want to encourage you that it's going to drop when they're ready to drop. Go on with your life. And when it drops, it drops. In the words of Drax, when holding the fruit away from Nebula, it's not ripe. <laughs> you got to wait. It's not going to happen at the Game Awards. No, I don't think so. That's not big enough. No, it isn't. Mm. What's really going to be funny is that after they do drop that first trailer, there's going to be... We're not going to see a lot of images. Mm Mm-hmm. And so people are just going to be asking, oh, when's it come next? So we're never going to be satisfied until we see the movie. And even then, we're just going to wonder... 
how far do we have to wait until Far From Home again? As soon as we see Captain Marvel, we're going to be like, okay, where's Avengers? And then yep. where's Spider-Man? And then where do we go from there? Where we go next on here is another franchise you may have heard of, Star Wars. Alan the Ace, he's been writing this question the last couple of days, so I want to make sure I got to it this week. He says, how powerful do you think Luke will be in Episode Nine? Hmm. Do you think he'll engage or fight someone? Thanks, guys. I mean, with his brain or the power... Kind of fought someone with his brain in, yeah. in yeah. episode eight. So would he just kind of pull the same thing? I mean, if Yoda was setting trees on fire as a force ghost, then like anything is possible. Yeah, that's nice. Right? Checks out with me. Yeah, anything's possible with, for me. So uh, how powerful is a good question. I don't think he can be the central focus of the power. So I think he'll have moments of showing what he can do and then pull back because the ghosts are supposed to be a guide. They're not supposed to actually actively help you out of a situation. They're supposed to be guides and it wouldn't make sense for him to go that route. You know, Ben only whispered in his ear, use the vault, Luke, when he was doing the thing. No, he and actually shouted it. It's just that he was really, <laughs> it was far, really far, away. far away. So it sounded like a whisper. <laughs> and Yoda, the same thing. Yoda only talked to Luke after Rey had left and it was to advise him about being an old Jedi master and what that entails. So, I yeah. mean, there's a reading of The Last Jedi that Luke has finally become what a Jedi should be mm. or realized what a Jedi should be because as we saw before, you know, when he was wearing the black and fighting, uh, he kind of felt mm. shocked by it, mm -hmm. that he had done the wrong thing. But when you look at Jediism, it isn't necessarily to be a badass, you know, right. lightsaber To take killer. out a laser sword and take on the entire First Order by yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's, it's more... I, I, it's more like monkish mm -hmm. or meditative uh, to try not to fight and the way that he was able to end The Last Jedi was a realization of of that. He, he accomplished the highest level he could accomplish as a Jedi. Yeah. So we'll see what episode nine has. I, you, I think we're going to see him in it. I think we're going to see the Force Ghost. I don't know if yeah. he's going to be actively continuing to train in some way. I don't know if a Force Ghost. I mean, you know, Force Ghosts have to sit down too, as Return of the Jedi proves to us. And thanks, JT, for pointing that out to the world. Is that Ben Kenobi was a Force Ghost? He also had to sit. <laughs> Which, which my take on that is that, yeah, he wanted to relate to Luke. Yeah. It's freaky when you see a ghost. If I see a ghost <laughs> haunting me, I don't want them hovering over me. I want them sitting down on a log next to me being like, hey, it's going to be okay, pal. I'm going to crack a, a posthumous beer. Mm. Roka, right. how do you like to see ghosts? I don't. No? <laughs> Not anywhere near me. Not even uh, sitting uh, down uh, on unless a log? They're kind you... Unless they're kind ghosts, then yes. But, you know, I don't No, I'm good. I don't need to ever see a ghost in my entire life. Okay, then we go to our last question, mm -hmm. and this is uh, a great one to go into our weekend with because I want the panelists, and I'll think about this myself too, <laughs> all weekend. I want you to think about John Ashford's question. Oh, boy. Because oh, he no. says, where were you, John? You were just there. It's a great, this is <laughs> how I build great questions setup. up. I yeah. love Control F. Was it John Ashford? Sorry, John. It might not have been your question. <laughs> I love this. Sorry, it was Aiden. Okay. John Ashford says, what next big bad would you want to see in the MCU? He sees Galactus coming. You guys see Galactus coming soon? Yep. The Eater of Worlds? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Thank you, John Ashford. And now we move on to Aiden. Aiden. He says, hey, Mark, love the show. <laughs> Who in the MCU would you like to narrate your life? Ooh. Uh, Drax the Destroyer. Great question. Drax the Destroyer, yeah. simple It would to be the point. hilarious all the time. We'd have a party. Okay. I wouldn't say Tony Stark because Tony Stark would make it about himself. Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't say Steve Rogers because he'd want to overlook my flaws. He would judge me. No, he would always say, every time I'm on stage and yeah. I drop an F-bomb, yeah. he would say, oh, you didn't need that. It, it, he son. felt like he had to work <laughs> blue and he didn't need it, son. <laughs> you, are you going to pick Groot? <laughs> oh, Groot's a good one. No. Rocket, Rocket would make you laugh, too. Rocket. It would have to be Rocket. You're on Rocket. My life's been such a crazy comical adventure anyway. It would just be perfect with his sarcasm. And then this idiot did this. It would just be perfect <laughs> for him to tell my life story. That being said, Scarlet, Black Widow would be great too because Scarlett Johansson in her is an incredible voice artist. I could go her. that way as yeah. well because She's it would feel like your narrator is also your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't want that? <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> no, actually, now that I think about it, I don't think I want my... My mate to narrate my life. I think, I think that when I'm away from the girlfriend, from the wife, the significant other. I narrate my boyfriend's life and he doesn't like it. So <laughs> just to put that out there. So, Roka, maybe be careful what you wish for there. I am going to go. It was at this point, John didn't make me dinner. Stop it. <laughs> it was at this point, I could tell John was lying again. 
<laughs> Who is Thor and Loki and Hela? The the children Ooh. of Odin. Odin. I want Anthony Hopkins Damn. narrating my life. I want Sir Anthony Eye Patch wielding Hopkins. But That's what? who's narrating my life because then my life would feel epic. Even the most mundane of tasks. Yeah. You know. What he about Carl's Jr.? He did that Amazon commercial. And he was like, oh, yeah, it was unsettling. It was yeah, he'd be great. Good. Loki as Odin. Loki as Odin. <laughs> Actually, I kind of like Loki as Odin. Get a little bit of a wink in the nod there. Um, it'll wink if you're Odin. You still have one good eye to wink through. And that is going to be us. That's going to be our show. That's going to be our week here at Collider Movie Talk. Thank you to all the great tweets that come in, all the constructive criticism comments. Thank you guys for watching the show and for attending last night's Avengers Infinity War screening. Like John Roca so ably segued into, we are going to have a Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse screening as part of our Collider screening series at the Arclight Theater in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. So check out Collider.com for more details. I want to give a heartfelt thank you to our panelists here today. Kim Horcher, thank you so much for making the time to stop by Yay. once again for enduring the rain that our roof... It's scary I, in Yeah, here. I think I that was rain. I hope that was rain. I thought it was a dragon about to eat the roof it off. It could have been frogs, could have been locusts. Uh, where can all the kids out there find you? Oh, well, first I need to email Roka's assistant to get on that list for the <laughs> Spider-Verse. <laughs> So I'm, I'm really hoping I'm into that. Uh, yeah. Twitter, Kim Scorcher. Instagram, Kim Horcher. Oh, and I barely nice. post on Facebook. Don't even bother. Yeah, the only oh. time Kim and I go on Facebook is to use Facebook Messenger, Messenger. And I go, you have my number. <laughs> now we're done nope. with that. <laughs> John Roca, where can all the children find you? Having your life narrated by your girlfriend. It was at this point that Mark Ellis made a terrible decision in the Schmodown. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that would be man that I'll get narrated. You're like, I didn't agree with it at all. Uh, all right, you can find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Hey, don't forget, we did Collider Sportsbook today with Josh McCuga Thursday night. And then tomorrow, we're dropping that sportsbook, giving you some uh, ideas of where to put your money on the Lions for all the NFL games and the big college football games happening this weekend. Go to Collider Sports YouTube channel and podcast channel. Listen to that. Mark Ellis handled the controversy with care and a death touch despite the cryings of Roca, a grown man a grown weeping man. over a movie trivia question. <laughs> By the way, check out the spectacular on the 21st. That's all for us here this week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.